And I'm extremely pleased to welcome everyone to Trauma and Memory in Vietnamese America, Anti-Communism, Authoritarianism, and Anti-Asian Violence in a Divided Community. This event is very timely uh, and very pressing, uh, and it's also very popular. As of five minutes ago, we had 749 registered uh, participants, um, and we're so pleased to have everyone here with us today. We're also extremely excited about featuring this webinar. Uh, the Weatherhead East Asian Institute is, co is sponsoring the webinar, uh, and the East Asian Institute is uh, very much promoting Vietnamese studies at Columbia. Traditionally, Weatherhead East Asian Institute focuses on the traditional aspects of East Asia, China, Japan, and Korea. But more recently, uh, we have been uh, much more ambitious in our scope. Uh, and uh, as the reality is the case that Southeast Asia and Vietnam are now uh, extremely important in the global world order, uh, and Colombia uh, is seeking to uh, really develop its expertise uh, and its knowledge on Vietnamese studies. So uh, I hope uh, that many of you listeners will continue to work with us and partner with us to continue to build uh, we are hoping to uh, fund and uh, establish a center for Vietnamese studies at the Weatherhead East Asian Institute. Uh, this panel is just one example of many exciting things that such a center could, could continue to support. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, Columbia is at a position to develop Vietnamese studies is because of two fabulous uh, recent faculty hires, uh, two uh, prestigious uh, leading scholars of Vietnamese studies uh, have joined Columbia faculty within the past five years. Uh, and the two of them have been working uh, to uh, uh, really make a, uh, you know, develop Vietnamese studies on the ground at Columbia. Um, and they are the two who convened today's webinar. Uh, let me just give their quick introduction and, uh, and then they will uh, in turn introduce uh, our all-star panel. First, I'd like to introduce Yen Han Nguyen, uh, she is the Dorothy Borg Associate Professor in the History of the United States and East Asia. She is the author of Hanoi's War, an International History of the War for Peace. She is currently working on a comprehensive history of the Tet Offensive. She is the general editor of the forthcoming three volume Cambridge History of the Vietnamese War. Uh, indeed, she's a leading scholar in Sino-Vietnamese relations uh, and modern Vietnamese history. Uh, the second person who I'd like to introduce is, an, uh, uh, is a rising star in the field. His name is John Fan, and he is an assistant professor of Vietnamese humanities in the Department of East a Asian Languages and Cultures. He is a, a historical phonologist specializing in the history of the Vietnamese and Chinese languages as well as the history of Vietnamese vernacular literary development. He is a 2021-2022 ACLS research fellow and his first book entitled Lost Tongues of the Red River, uh, Annamese Middle Chinese and the Origins of the Vietnamese Language is er currently under contract with Harvard Asia Center Press. It is now my honor to turn the panel over to Professor Wen. Thank you, Eugenia. Thank you, everyone who is, who's made this possible. Um, so again, uh, holding trauma and memory in Vietnamese America, uh, an event that seeks to understand the community's collective past, to shed light on its divergent present and perhaps inform a shared future on this very day is particularly poignant to me. Today marks the 46th anniversary of April 30th, 1975, an event most commonly referred to uh, in America as the fall of Saigon, officially in Vietnam as Ngai Yai Phong, um, or Liberation Day, but among many in the Vietnamese American community as Ngai Muk Nu, uh, or loss of country. How one refers to it, of course, reveals the contested memory of that war uh, and its enduring legacies. This day for most Vietnamese Americans does not, and here I cannot repeat myself enough, my students know this, does not reside in the distant past, but enjoys many spirited afterlives uh, as we'll see today. Yet tomorrow marks a very different day. 
May 1st is the first day of Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month in honor and recognition of the contributions of the community to the history, culture, and achievements of the United States. As we watch the course of this deadly pandemic, confluent spread of authoritarianism, and seemingly unfettered rise in anti-Asian hate, we've never needed this upcoming month more here in America. So this tough but necessary conversation will be divided into three segments. First, we'll address the role that memory of the war and April 30th um, and how that, you know, how that role of the memory of, of the war and of April 30th uh, has informed Vietnamese American political participation in the United States since 1975. The second segment uh, will focus on the shifting representations and significance of the waving of the South Vietnamese flag during the storming of the US Capitol uh, on January 6th. And the third and final segment explores how Vietnamese Americans see the rise of authoritarianism and, and the concurrent recent spike in anti-Asian hate. Uh, finally, before I turn things over to John, uh, who will introduce our esteemed panelists, I'm only hoping for two things of this event. First, I hope to put on full display the diversity and the strength uh, of our community of 2.2 million Americans of Vietnamese descent. Second, I hope that this conversation will only be one uh, of many more to come to promote greater dialogue and exchange within the community and form a basis uh, to build coalitions outside of it. If we achieve those two aims, uh, I will declare this event on April 30th, 2021, uh, a complete victory. And this is live from Columbia University. So with that, John. Hello, everybody, and thank you, Hal. Uh, first, I, I, I can't help but admit that as a specialist on historical linguistics, I feel terribly unqualified to participate in this conversation. Nevertheless, uh, these are issues that deeply impact us all within, across, and beyond the Vietnamese and Vietnamese American communities. It feels like a moment in which Vietnamese history, Vietnamese American history, and uh, have collided with broader American history in explosive, sometimes tragic, but also perhaps hopeful ways. It's unquestionably a moment of reckoning within the Vietnamese American community, where we must confront the forces that divide us as well as re-examine our roles in American society. Therefore, in addition to the three topical segments that Han has introduced, I would like to emphasize a running theme for today's event, and that is intergenerationality. It has been 46 years since the end of the war, and Vietnamese Americans and the broader Vietnamese diaspora now comprise multiple generations, from those who fought and bled in the war, to those who arrived as children, to the children of the children of those who first took helicopter, plane, and boat to come to these shores. The multiple tragedies and the challenges of the past two years has revealed to us how destructive divisiveness can be, and how important it is to create dialogue within and across different communities and perhaps ultimately to find solidarity and common ground despite our differences. Each of our speakers today stand between the oldest and the youngest generations of the Vietnamese diaspora. And each have held diverse life experiences that inform their visions and their understandings of anti-communism, of authoritarianism, and anti-Asian violence in our communities. Ting Hoi is an Australian lawyer of Vietnamese origin, a former refugee and a re-education camp survivor. Hoi graduated from Melbourne University Law School and also completed uh, an MA at Oxford University in 2002. He is co-founder of VOICE, a regional NGO that was devoted to developing civil society in Vietnam. And in addition to his well-known work in the entertainment sector, Hoi has done extensive work on human rights and was uh, recently awarded a fellowship from the US government to complete a course at the Harvard Kennedy School entitled Leading Nonviolent Movements for Social Progress. Our second speaker, Lan Gao, is the Betty Hutton Williams Professor of International Economic Law at Chapman Law School. Lan was a Ford Foundation Scholar in 1991 and joined the Fowler School of Law in 2013 after serving for over a decade as the Boyd Fellow and Professor of Law at William & Mary Law School. Her scholarship focuses on the rule of law, economic and political development, culture, and law. And she is the author of Made in the USA, Race, Trade, and Prison Labor, as well as Information Institute, excuse me, Informal Institutions and Property Rights, among many other works. 
She is also the celebrated author of the novel Monkey Bridge and writes fiction on the side. Finally, our last panelist, Viet Thanh Nguyen, is a writer and a scholar who teaches at the University of Southern California. He holds the Errol Arnold's Chair of English and is the author of Race and Resistance, Literature and Politics in Asian America. His novel, The Sympathizer, is a New York Times bestseller and won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. He has also earned the Dayton Literary Peace Prize and the Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction from the American Library Association. His current book, The Committed, which is now available, is the highly anticipated sequel to The Sympathizer. As diverse members of a middle generation, our three panelists are uniquely situated to begin what we hope will ultimately be a dialogue across the generations. Therefore, in every question that we pose today, we ask that both the panelists and the attendees consider not merely our own individual generational or sociocultural point of view, not simply the deficiencies of one group versus another, nor merely the messaging each one of us might hope to bring to the wider community, but also how one generation might speak to another, how one generation might learn from another, and how we might proceed in a matter that deepens our understanding of ourselves as Vietnamese and Vietnamese Americans of the first 1.5 and second generations and beyond. So before I turn things back over to Hang to begin our first segment, just a couple practical notes that I want to inform the audience of. First, we're very thankful to Nguyen Quoc Vinh, a member of our Read Me Studies program here, who is standing by in case anyone would, would like, anyone from the audience uh, would like clarification in Vietnamese and or would like to pose their question in Vietnamese during the Q&A. Uh, Mr. Vinh will be, will be standing by to translate those questions for the broader audience. Mr. Ving will also be supplying uh, formal subtitles of our recorded event that will be released later on in some form. Uh, so please uh, stand by for that. Finally, in terms of questions and answers, uh, please feel free audience members to, to write your questions in as they occur to you over the course of the event into the chat box. Uh, Lian Han Nguyen and I will be moderating and selecting from that body of questions when we get to question and answer at the end of the event today. All right, with that, I'd like to turn things back to Hang, who will lead our first session on contested history and memory of April 30th and of the afterlives of the Vietnam War. Thanks, John. So most Americans think of US narratives of the Vietnam War, notions of a quagmire, uh, of a stalemate, of a, possibly a, an imperial venture that led us uh, to war in mainland Southeast Asia, of how a Vietnam syndrome descended over uh, the United States in the 80s and 90s, and even up to uh, presidential elections uh, up until uh, the election of Barack Obama, where every candidate had to count on what they were doing uh, during the Vietnam War era. Now, these are American touchstones. These are US narratives. Uh, but few people, few, few non-Vietnamese Americans recognize the continuing trauma and distinct narratives of South Vietnamese afterlives of that war. I want to ask each of you, how do you see the memory and trauma of the war as present in modern Vietnamese American identity, culture, uh, and political performance? Let me start. I'm Lan Cao, and thank you so much, Columbia University and Hang and John for organizing this. Uh, it's, it's, it's strange, you know, I've been here for 40 something years and, and uh, still very emotional, this topic for me. Uh, so I'll speak a little bit about my family's experience and how um, April 30th has defined my identity uh, in both my scholarship and uh, in my fiction writing. So my father was a, I, I think of him mostly as a commander of the Airborne Brigade. So he was away on um, various battlefields. I think he was in 54 altogether um, and had been badly wounded and I think got a, a wrong blood transfusion. So the war was, you know, just like an omnipresent um, identity. It's like its own character in, in our lives. And, but at the same time, um, I had an uncle who was, uh, in the National Liberation Front, the Viet Cong, which means that as I was growing up, you know, it, we, we were immersed in just all the nuances and strands uh, of the war, socially, politically. Um, and it, it entered our lives at dinner tables. So I never grew up really 
having a demonized view of anybody that were in, in that conflict. Um, also, my father was born in Laos. So Laos was like in the background mountain and, and how the war affected Laos. A very uh, important how I being a, a child of war. Um, Chinese enclave where the Chinese were the majority. So some, and, and, and at the same time, some of the fiercest soldiers in my father's battalions were Khmer soldiers. And I grew up with them, you know, in, in our gardens and mingling with them. So the Vietnam War was like an Indochina war to me. It was just all over in our lives. Um, the fall of Saigon was, was a cataclysmic event for us. And when the, we left and came to the US, there was a lot of kind of like what happened, how did it happen, why did it happen? And a lot of this was directed internally as well as externally. And I think my parents were unlike other parents in the sense that they were willing to talk to me about things that I had questions about. And as I grew older, I, I was very curious uh, about all the historical events and did have a lot of conversation with them about it. Um, in terms of the war being present in the Vietnamese American culture, um, I feel self and even April 30th is not dead. Um, and I think of Faulkner's statement that the past is never dead, it's not even past, is very, very much uh, something that's applicable to me. I feel like it's imprinted uh, in, my, in, in my very being. And so um, it, it's informed my fiction writing for sure. I feel like I am, uh, there's a very wonderful book called This Bridge Called My Back, uh, which is written by third world uh, women. And I always feel with respect to Vietnam and April 30th and the war that I am the bridge that tries to um, make connections among all the different groups of Vietnamese, as well as non-Vietnamese who are affected by the war. And um, in my fiction, I do want to, uh, of course, talk about the war, but not make it be so defining that all of Vietnam is the war. So sometimes I go against my own grain because the war is so dominant. Um, but what I try to do is also bring in some other representation of Vietnam that is non-war, uh, even though the war is such a resounding uh, Ever present part of my life. Hoi. Hello, Jilang, and, and thank you for that, Jilang. Uh, if I may uh, add, because uh, uh, I'm not a writer like like Jilang, but um, what I well b before I start, uh, I just want to say that I'm so thrilled to be at this talk because um, it's kind of, it's kind of like a bucket list uh, on, on my part, right? I mean, finally, I get to have a talk at Columbia, even though I don't have any degrees in the US and I'm surrounded by four professors. So thank you, um, Columbia for inviting me uh, to, to share my story today. Uh, I wanted to add to what Dilang says uh, regarding April 30th. And that is, I think the, the, the trauma or the memory of April 30th really depends on one's own personal experience uh, as well as sort of what, what one has gone through uh, through the family um, exodus. So for me, I stayed back in Vietnam. I was born in 1970. So I don't have any memories of the war, but I have all the memories after the war. So my first memory was uh, as a child was of visiting my dad in re-education camp. I, I wanna give the audience a bit of a glance at Vietnam. Um, so Vietnam right now, we have uh, roughly 100 million people. We have about 4 million uh, Vietnamese overseas and we have about 97 million uh, inside the country. So, you know, roughly 100 million. And that is the 14th most populous nation in the world. So it's, it's, it's a fairly large uh, population. That's number one. Number two, um, because the the war is still pretty fresh. I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, the Armenian uh, genocide or, you know, the debates regarding the civil war here and, and, and slavery and all that, you, the, the war only ended 
in 75, as Professor Nguyen said, right? So it's, it's really only 46 years ago. So the, the war is still so fresh in so many minds, including mine, because I'm, I guess out of all the three panelists, I'm the only one who stayed back in Vietnam for 10 years. I didn't go to Australia until the age of 14 um, with my family. So uh, I know that the memories that I have of Vietnam after 75 has everything to do with what I think of April 30th. Without April 30th, uh, I wouldn't end up where I am today. And, and neither would any of us would end up here, whether we like it or not, right? I mean, Viet might still be in Vietnam, Chi Lang might still be in Vietnam, and both of you might still be in Vietnam. So for me, first, it depends on one's memory of Vietnam and, and how long you were there, when you were born, and whether you have gone through uh, life under communism after the war in 1975. So like my dad went to re-education camp, uh, like hundreds of thousands of other Vietnamese soldiers. Um, my, my youngest brother died in um, you know, a new economic zone when our family, after my dad's release, was not allowed to live in Saigon anymore where we were from, but we were banished to a remote island um, after his release in 77. And then that's where he escaped uh, from, from Vietnam in 1979. Um, so that's the first kind of point that I wanna make um, regarding that, that sort of memory. Um, the, the second thing I wanna talk about is, um, it's, I guess it also depends on the education that each of us receives because like Viet, um, you know, the next panelist uh, once said, you know, he said something like war is fought once on the battleground, but the next one is in memories. And, and that is why I think that if people don't have specific memories of the Vietnam War and of April 30th, usually then they will have to learn it through memories of others. And so our education, uh, whether it is in the UK, in Australia or in the US, will then shape us and, and help us understand what it means. Um, I, I wanted to talk a bit about the differences between the communities, the Vietnamese communities in Australia and in the US and then in Europe, because uh, I have traveled and work as a human rights activist around the world. So I, you know, I, I want to share with that, but I want to leave that to the, to the next segment. Uh, over to you, Viet. Thanks so much. Uh, I want to thank Lin Hang and John and the Weatherhead East Asian Institute for hosting us on this you know, important occasion. And it's also a thrill to be here with Gitlan and Anho as well. You know, um, I, 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 my background is that I'm probably the most Americanized out of our three panelists here today because I was four years old when I came to the United States. Uh, my background uh, with my parents is that we're Vietnamese Catholics. So my parents fled in 1954 from the North to the South. They were ardent anti-communist as most of the Catholics are. And then they fled again in 1975. So we were lucky um, in, in our own way to be able to leave in that first wave. And we settled in Fort Indian Town Gap in Pennsylvania. That was our refugee camp of resettlement. And that's really where my memories begin. You know, I was four years old at the time. And in order to leave one of these refugee camps, you had to have an American sponsor. And what happened to our family was that there wasn't a sponsor willing to take all four of us. So one sponsor took my parents, one sponsor took my 10 year old brother, one sponsor took four year old me. And so my memories begin in a refugee camp, howling and screaming as I was being taken away from my parents. Now that was being done for benevolent reasons to give my parents the time to get on their own two feet. But I experienced that obviously as a four year old, as a sense of abandonment. And I'm still working out my emotional issues today as a writer. So I, you know, being a refugee is not all bad. It gave me the requisite emotional damage to become a writer. So I'm thankful for that. Um, you know, but I grew up, you know, obviously aware of being Vietnamese, aware of the war uh, and its legacy and April 30th and all of that. But I also grew up, uh, my intellectual formation was as an Asian American when I went to UC Berkeley. And I think that that has had a huge impact on the way that I see the war in Vietnam and the way I see many of the issues that we're going to be talking about. So I've always been concerned about that war and concerned about what uh, Jilan brought up that obviously we shouldn't think of Vietnam only as a war, but nevertheless that we still need to think of that war in our own way because I grew up obviously saturated with American versions 
of the war in Vietnam on the one hand, mass popular Hollywood versions. And on the other hand, I also grew up deeply immersed in the Vietnamese refugee community. And so I'm very familiar, I think, with the sense of April 30th being what many Vietnamese Americans, anti-communist refugees would call Black April, right? So my own feeling on this is that I wanted to investigate this war in fiction and in nonfiction in a way that would be different than how Americans have typically remembered it and how Vietnamese Americans have typically remembered it. So I wrote a book called Nothing Ever Dies, Vietnam and the Memory of War. And it gestures towards one of the things that Jilan talked about, which is that the Vietnam War was really an Indochina war that was fought in Laos and Cambodia as well to equally devastating effect at the very least. And so in Nothing Ever Dies, I wanted to talk about the war as something that involved Americans, South Koreans, Laotians, Cambodians, Hmong, and the Vietnamese, and not just Vietnamese Americans or anti-communist Vietnamese or South Vietnamese, but also the communist Vietnamese. And what I think that I saw looking at all these communities, that one thing they all shared in common is that they all thought of themselves as victims. Everybody thinks that they were the victims in this war and that terrible things were done to them. And in fact, that is, that is what happened. But when we think of a war in that way, how do we account for who might be responsible? If everybody's a victim, then who is the victimizer? Is anyone the victimizer? These are pretty complex moral and political kinds of questions. And my own feeling in that is that I wanted to, to, to look at uh, what I call the ethics of recognition in Nothing Ever Dies. And by that, I meant that it, would, that it was crucial from both a political and historical, and then also ultimately an artistic perspective from my own fiction to think about the fact that we are all, no matter what side we are on, capable of humanity and inhumanity. And this to me seemed to be a crucial distinction because when I look at American perspectives and, and Vietnamese perspectives, typically, you know, everybody's eager to proclaim their humanity, their goodness, their bravery, their patriotism, and so on. And to accuse the other side of atrocities and inhuman behavior and so on, without being able to acknowledge that the other side might be motivated by good ideals of patriotism and idealism and all of that, and that our own side might have been capable of committing atrocities and doing terrible things because that's usually what happens in war. But bringing up these kinds of perspectives is obviously complicated because no side really wants to see that aspect of themselves or that aspect of the other side. So in The Sympathizer, my novel, the, the way it opens up is by me saying, it's April 30th, it's the end of the war, which is either the fall of Saigon or the liberation of Saigon, depending on your perspective. Well, growing up in the Vietnamese American community, there is no possibility of such a perspective. It is the fall of Saigon, it is Black April, and to bring, up, bring it up as anything else is to automatically risk being seen as a communist. And so that's sort of, in this context, that's sort of what my work risks, but I think it's absolutely necessary uh, to do that. So this is a very Vietnamese American event. And I just wanna end by talking about Vietnamese Americans and growing up in this Vietnamese refugee community. I do feel that you know, the dominant tone of the Vietnamese American community has been defined by this idea that Vietnamese Americans, Vietnamese refugees, South Vietnamese people have suffered tremendously under communism and that communists are evil and inhuman. That is the dominant public perspective. And it's very difficult to deviate from that. And it has lent a certain kind of emotional tenor to Vietnamese American conversations and memories about the war. I, I would characterize this emotional tenor as being marked by anger, bitterness, melancholy, sadness, and resentment. And it's something that I that I I'm, I'm not criticizing that. I, I think these are really important and valid emotions. And those of us in the 1.5 and second generation have absorbed these emotions and have struggled with them as well. But I would hope that, uh, and then we see this in the literature. And tonight I'm hosting an event on April 30th for uh, Diasporic Vietnamese Artist Network. I'll put the link in the, in the chat, but it's bringing together, you know, writers like uh, Lan Gao, uh, Jung, uh, Jung Van Mai Elliot, Lily Hayslip, and Marcelino Jung from France to talk about this from the perspective of literature. But we're, but we're all, we're all, struggling still with the war and what it means. It's so defined our lives as Vietnamese people and as artists. But I'm hoping that the second generation and beyond won't be defined by this kind of historical and emotional legacy. It's not that these legacies aren't important, but the second generation needs to be able to shape its own future and to shape its own reality. Oh, and now we are into the next question. <laughs> 
So should we move on to the next segment then immediately? Okay, uh, we're, this is a brisk pace, but we will have time for Q&A and a little bit more of a relaxed discussion later on. Um, so I'm going to pose the question for the next set of themes that uh, Lian Hang uh, mentioned at the beginning of the event. And once again, please do type in your questions. Um, if, as they occur to you, we will be combing through the chat box for the Q&A session at the end. So uh, we're gonna move on to, um, I think the event that, that initiated the organization of this, um, this panel, which is the January 6th insurrection and the presence of the RBN flag at the storming at the Capitol. Uh, I'm sure I don't have to say that for many in the Vietnamese American community, the presence of the RBN flag at the January 6th storming was really shocking. Um, and for others, it clearly was uh, something else. You know, former President Trump's challenge to the legal election of President Biden felt like a call to action of some kind. Um, and so such polarized responses to the January 6th insurrection forces us to question the nature of Vietnamese American political identity. You know, I think in the last, in the discussion we just had, it's clear that the war is, there's the ghost of the war uh, in our community. And then there's the hope that our community is going to grow beyond it. But that growth, in some ways, it's been said that that growth is impossible without a kind of reckoning. And I think that's the sort of theme of this second set of questions. Um, in some senses, the traumas of the 20th century are foundational to Vietnamese diaspora community and political performance specifically. Furthermore, the oldest generation of those who were citizens of the Republic of Vietnam are by no means a monolithic community, but rather an intellectually, politically, socially, and culturally diverse group. And I think as is increasingly clear, that diversity is matched by sometimes radically different positions on race, culture, and power held by the 1.5 and second generations of Vietnamese Americans. So the question is really as follows. Um, what we can say is that an attraction to performances of political will and strongman theatrics, whether staged as outsider intervention or party strength, is particularly arresting if it occurs within our, the Vietnamese American community, as these are elsewhere recognized as hallmarks of authoritarian regimes, such as evidenced by Xi Jinping, Vladimir Putin. So given these facts, and given the what appears to be an attraction to those very kinds of performances, you know, among, among parts of the community. How do you, each of you understand the origins and nature of the current political divisions among the Vietnamese American community, particularly the divisive response to the insurrection? And what explains the specifically Vietnamese American attraction, if there is such a thing, to strongman or authoritarianesque political performance? And finally, how does the culture of anti-communism within our community interact with his apparent attraction to authoritarianism? So I think we'll start with Hoi this time. Thank you, John. Uh, before I answer the questions, I just want to um, talk a bit about what Viet just said. Um, and I think that the Vietnamese American community's memory and then um, understanding of April 30th isn't just about the war, but it is uh, directly related to the situation in Vietnam right now. Um, and therefore it's not just about the past, but it's also the, about the present and the future. Uh, so I just wanna make, make that, that point. Um, I guess before I, I talk about uh, my perspective as a human rights activist and, and what I understand about the Vietnamese community around the world. Again, I wanna go back to the makeup of the communities around the world first, right? Uh, as I said at the start, we have about 97 million Vietnamese in Vietnam and about 4 million overseas Vietnamese. Now, around 2 million uh, are in the US. However, the, the, there's a difference between the Vietnamese community in Australia or in Canada where there are approximately about 300,000 to 250,000 Vietnamese in each country. Um, most of them come from the boat people exodus um, and therefore they pretty much have one common identity and therefore one common understanding of the war and the trauma they went through. The US, not just because of the size, but because of the makeup of the community is, is different. Number one, in 1975, within, you know, I think two or three weeks uh, before the fall of Saigon on, on April 30th, uh, 
140,000 uh, Vietnamese were able to leave Vietnam and resettle um, in the US uh, within a few weeks and a few months. I mean, that's a huge number. That was, um, I think, the biggest humanitarian um, uh, undertaking by the US Army uh, at the time. So that particular group is large. And because they left 46 years ago, they and their family members don't have that many memories of Vietnam and what happened thereafter. Compare that group with the HO group. So the US took in roughly 40,000 Vietnamese and their family members. And these people were in prison in Vietnam after the war uh, because of their involvement with the South Vietnamese army. Because of that, that particular group still holds very strong views on Vietnam, on anti-communism, and on what the Vietnamese American community should be, right? That view is very then different from the, what I call the boat people um, view, right? So that's a third group. And the fourth group that doesn't exist in Europe, in Canada, or Australia, is the immigrant group. Under US immigration laws, brothers and sisters can sponsor each other. M moms and dad can sponsor kids over, and then the kids can sponsor the kids over, right? And because of the family reunion program in the US and the general, and, and it's quite generous, right? As a result, you have a fairly large number of Vietnamese in the US who didn't come here as refugees. They pretty much came here as immigrants. And therefore they don't have that many political views. Or, or that strong of a political view that made them leave Vietnam in the first place. And because of the four distinctive groups in the US that are very different from the Vietnamese community group elsewhere, that's why you tend to have all these views that, are, that seem to be conflicting. But if you really look at the groups and how they were, uh, how, were how were they given birth, then you understand, well, you know, it, it's, it's understandable. You know, the immigrant Vietnamese who came to the US 10 years ago, we probably don't think that much of April, 40, uh, April 30th because their entire life, they grew up in Vietnam and April 30th is a, is a huge long weekend holiday for them, right? It's, it's liberation. What, what are you talking about? You know, um, a losing country, unlike the ones that, that came out as former political prisoners in Vietnam, they suffered so much in Vietnam, their families are still being split. And because of that, it, even though it seems like the, the divisiveness um, is really a lot in our community, uh, it's actually quite understandable given what happened in Vietnam in the past and what's still happening right now in Vietnam. The fact is Vietnam is still a one party state, right? The fact is that the difference and the divisiveness came not just between the Vietnamese communities, but also between human rights defenders, between human rights defenders who do the work because of their universal human rights values that they hold uh, opposed, as opposed to ideological understanding of it or ideolo ideological um, uh, values that they have. And the last thing I wanted to say is that the divisiveness came also not just from the political uh, differences, you know, it's not like just Democrats versus Republicans, which is, and, and there is an element of that, but it's also about our cultural differences, right? Um, I just wanted to mention that when what happened uh, at Capitol Hill on January 6th, I mean, I wrote an article in Vietnamese uh, for the BBC um, denouncing such an attack on democracy. And I was criticized by a lot of my, my supporters for my human rights work in Vietnam. Why? Because to many of them, you don't criticize government, right? Go criticizing government is something that is frowned upon in our culture. And, and I still remember um, distinctively how one, um, uh, uh, my dad's friend, uh, would write to me and said, hey, I am uh, your dad's friend and who are you to criticize someone who's as old as your dad? I mean, being Trump, 
and and it struck me as something like, oh wow. Um, so this is not about you know the political differences. It's not about even democracy. This is about age. You know, you're not supposed to criticize the elderly. Um, so if you understand the Vietnamese community and our cultural differences, then you understand why the divisiveness uh, has to take place. And and like Viet said, we will we hope that the second generation and the third generation of Vietnamese will continue to have this dialogue and this talk so that we can understand April 30th and what it means better. All right, so over to you. You know, I, I have to admit being very Americanized because one of the things I don't understand about this idea that you're not supposed to criticize your elders is how did the Vietnamese in Vietnam ever change anything if you can't criticize your elders? How was there a revolution? How was there a civil war? If people were afraid of like, you know, criticizing the, the older people who they, they disagreed with politically. Anyway, someone's got to explain that to me at some point. But I'll, I'll start off with a little, I mean, thanks to Hoi for all these, um, you know, really nuanced conversation about the differences within the vast diasporic community. I'll just add my own little anecdote about this uh, around the war in memory, which is that, you know, uh, you're all probably aware that the, the, the flag is a controversial issue. You know, it's the yellow flag or the red flag, the right flag to fly on certain occasions, et cetera. At my university, University of Southern California, I didn't even pay any attention to this, but in our international hall, the flag that represents Vietnam is the red flag. And I became aware of this about 10 years ago when it, uh, an Orange County Vietnamese American activist came to campus and stapled the yellow flag over the red flag. And so then I felt compelled along with my colleague Janet Hoskins to organize an event to talk about this. And we brought together the Vietnamese students and they came in two groups. One was the Vietnamese Student Association composed of Vietnamese Americans. And one was the Vietnamese International Student Association composed of international students from Vietnam. And it was really interesting to hear their conversation because the Vietnamese international students said, we understand your pain, we understand your trauma, we wanna reconcile with you. And the Vietnamese American students said, we don't wanna reconcile with you. <laughs> we, we respect our parents and our elders and everything they've been through and we can't let go of this past and what they've been through and that emotional trauma. And the way I interpreted that was that for the Vietnamese international students, and I'm just homogenizing their background, they came from the, the, victor, the victorious society. And so in some ways, it's, it's, it's a little bit easier if you won the war or won something to extend the hand of magnanimity and reconciliation. Whereas for a lot of Vietnamese Americans, I think, uh, you know, there, some of them are still focused on, on this past and, and on the question of loss. So one thing I want to point out in addition on this question of diversity, you know, we, when we look at the Vietnamese American community, oftentimes we think of it as being totally anti-communist, totally conservative and so on, but it's always been politically diverse. I mean, since Vietnamese people started to come here in the 1950s and the 1960s as students and as military trainees and the like, there have been political factions. So in the 1960s, during the height of the war in Vietnam, there was a pro-war, pro-government part of the Vietnamese um, uh, international student population. And there was an anti-war, anti-government part of the Vietnamese student population. But that political diversity was completely overridden after 1975 with the arrival of mass numbers of anti-communist Vietnamese refugees. And that really set the political tone for the community for the next few decades. I think there was always political diversity beneath that, but people who might be described as being left of center, liberal, progressive in some way, learned very quickly to be silent about their attitudes, at least when it came to the question of Vietnam. They could be political and speak out about other issues not related to the war in a progressive way, but not about the war in Vietnam. And I think that's pretty much defined the public tenor of the community when it came to these questions of communism, Vietnam, human rights, and so on. But I think something did change in the previous presidential administration because the general divisiveness that pervaded all of American society and culture and politics affected the Vietnamese American community as well. And so the general political divisions that all Vietnamese Americans felt one way or another, whether they were Democrats or Republicans, also attached itself to all the various questions that we're talking about today around the war and communism and how to deal with these things. And so, you know, one, one of the, uh, the things that came up in the last few years is that more and more younger Vietnamese Americans, more and more liberal to left Vietnamese Americans have been willing to speak up. And they've found themselves sometimes in conflict 
with an older generation or with a pro-Trump or a deeply anti-communist uh, population. And I'm really generalizing because it's not simply that all older Vietnamese are pro-Trump or, or anti-communist. I think there are liberals and leftists in that population. And it's not as if all younger Vietnamese Americans are liberals or leftists or Democrats. There are obviously anti-communist and pro-Trump uh, supporters there as well, but that's the tendency in these two generational directions. So I think it's a real challenge for the Vietnamese American community and, and what I've seen is that the generational differences make it more difficult to talk about the political and cultural differences. So younger Vietnamese Americans, many of them do feel a genuine sense of appreciation and respect for what an older generation has gone through and what it has experienced and what it has sacrificed for the younger generation, but they still feel the need to speak out. And it's complicated to try to figure out how to do, how to hold these two things how to make these two things possible at the same time to speak out and to still be respectful. And for the older generation, I think from my perspective, it seems that there's a tendency to dismiss the younger generation as being naive and inexperienced. And that makes it very difficult to, to have a conversation across generations. I don't have an answer for how to, how, how to achieve that conversation, but that seems to be the dilemma that within the Vietnamese American community we're facing. And now it's on to Jilan. Okay. So, you know, since 1995, I've been, um, I, I joined legal, legal academia. And the issue that has animated almost all of my scholarship is really on the issue of why are some countries poor and why are some countries rich? And the legal infrastructure and system that may facilitate um, political economic development. And so the term development is a very uh, contested term in the literature, right? Some would just say development is simply increasing your GNP. Um, others would say you need that and political development. I think most people say development includes political development, not just economic nowadays. But the issue of sequencing is always uh, a point of debate, which is if you look at the countries that have moved up the economic ladder, the claim is that they focus on economics first and then they follow through with political development. Um, so the examples would be, you know, most of the East Asian countries. Uh, that, that's, the, that's the conventional standard uh, in the literature. And uh, in recent years, there's more of a sense that development should be understood holistically. And one of the biggest proponent of that, and I'm from that school, is uh, by Amartya Sen, who is the Nobel laureate in economics. And he talked about how uh, democracy is extremely important simultaneously for economic development as well. So uh, politics is not something to be in the background until economics can be launched. And um, I, I think, the issue of democracy is something that should unite all of us who are in the Vietnamese diaspora because um, democracy is what we left everything to, to, to come to, right? To have freedom. And um, I think a communist system is not just authoritarian, but totalitarian. And there's a difference because it, it's a little bit more hegemonic. So it, it was shocking for me to see the yellow flag um, in the position that it was seen because I felt given my, my 40 plus years of study on rule of law and democracy, that you cannot have democracy through strong men tactics, right? It's not like you can say the best way to protect democracy is to be authoritarian. Uh, the way to protect democracy is to be democratic. And it's also, it's also for Vietnamese Americans, okay? We, we came to America and the shining city on the hill that beckoned us is an, an American style democracy. And I think it's important to understand what American style democracy is. It is not majority rule and it is not about monolithic strength. In fact, if you study uh, the constitutional system, Every single clause and structure of the constitution is designed to disaggregate power. So it, it is 
poignant for me and somewhat paradoxical to see a people that thirst for democracy and freedom not understand that it's really antithetical to strong men politics, right? Because if you look at the American constitutional system, um, everything is about separation of powers in the federal system itself. So you're talking about the executive, the legislative, and the judiciary. They're separate co-equal branches and power is not concentrated in any one of them, in any one of the branch. On top of that, the American system is a federal system so that the federal government vis-a-vis -vis the state government is also not ruling over the state. Now this can play out politically in different ways. And if you're a Republican or a Democrat, you may view federalism differently. But organically speaking, right, federalism is about the federal government being a government of limited power with very specifically enumerated powers that the federal government can exercise jurisdiction over. And anything that is not enumerated in the constitution that is for the gov federal government is to be retained by the state and the people. So, uh, and, and then even within the executive branch, you know, in, in the tug of war between the executive branch and the congressional branch, uh, even in areas where there is overlap, like uh, immigration, or even in areas where there is not a lot of overlap, where the president is con considered the commander in chief, um, there, even there, there is, there is no unitary power. So if one yearns for freedom and democracy, it would seem to me that we should be really um, cognizant of the system that we are joining, which is a system that is very much designed um, to disperse power. And in fact, um, it could very, it can very well be stated that the way the system has been built, uh, you, you may have deadlock, right? So um, the founders preferred deadlock over unitary power. And that's the way the system is supposed to work. And, and then you have the Bill of Rights, right? Which is that the individual have rights against the government, which means you can criticize the government and um, we leave everything to come to a system where we can criticize the government. And that means, where, where, where does it say we can criticize the government? First Amendment, you know, freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of religion. So I think the, the idea that there can be no dissent that would create weakness is just not a democratic idea. On top of that, this, the American system is designed to be in many ways, anti-majoritarian. So you may think that that is an oxymoron because you think of democracy as majority rule, but there are many strands within the constitution that are uh, established in order to make sure that even when you have a democratic government and a democratic legislature enacting laws that are a reflection of majoritarian will, that that law can be struck down by non-democratically elected Article Three judges so that they are not subject to the demagoguery of the majority, right? That's why Article Three judges have tenure for life so that they do not have to run for election and maybe to uh, the majority will. And I think that's very important for us, especially. I mean, I think it's a great system nonetheless, but for minorities, uh, it is important that, that we have a system that is not purely naked majority, not that version of democracy, but a version of a democracy that has majority um, oriented uh, inclinations, but also very, very robust protection for the minority. So to me, uh, that understanding of democracy and of American constitutionalism is what I hope would be appealing to Vietnamese Americans, especially because we fled in order to come to this country. And this country is not about, um, at least in, in its structure, whether or not over history, it has had departures from that is a different issue. But in, in its structure, its aspiration is no strong man, no emperor dispersed power, protection for the minority against majority will. And so I think if our young, and, and I understand the older generation, maybe, you know, as Viet says, I mean, it, I, I am painting a broad stroke here. There are exceptions, 
and I, I think it's it's under it, I, I try to realize that um, for those of us who have the luxury of having benefited from our parents' sacrifice so that we can go and study these things, um, that we understand also that you know there's a sense that we are where we are because we were weak. So we need to be strong and to be strong means no dissent. But that to me is a very uh, thin veneer understanding of strength, right? Because the strength we're talking about is a constitutional strength, which is what I think and I hope that we will all um, understand and work towards to establish rule of law in our own community and in this country. Thank you so much. There's, uh, I have, oh, go ahead, Han. Sorry. Oh, sorry to to all three of you. Um, we're moving to our third segment, and and you know this is a great uh, segue as I am watching, and you know the the chat uh, basically blow up. We've gotten so many uh, questions. Um, you know this this I'm going to scrap what I sort of had planned, um, and and you know sort of tying together all of the comments made in the first two segments. Uh, and then bringing in, you know, sort of the genesis of, of how the, the five of us had conceived of this, of this conversation today in which, you know, when we planned this, the current spike rise in anti-Asian violence had not yet come to, you know, its, its, its full scale. We were really reckoning and dealing with January 6th and, and the insurrection and the storming of the Capitol and Vietnamese American complicity in it. But with this, you know, rise in anti-Asian violence, this is, you know, the stakes are much higher. Uh, you know, the, the, the rubber meets the road here. The question I have, and this ties together contested memory of April 30th of the war, the, the inability to communicate across generations. What did various, you know, our very heterogeneous, very diverse Vietnamese Americans do leading up to the election and on January 6th, you know, the debates that we had, was there an argument or could you make the argument that those who did uh, attend were there on January 6th, were, are they complicit in the, basically the flourishing of white supremacy? Uh, should they have seen that direct line from from their actions to where we are now in this spring of hate? And if you add on to that, particularly, and I'm pulling from your your comments about being unable to speak to our elders. Right now, our elders, right, are the ones that are most uh, vulnerable. If you look at the cases of anti-Asian violence uh, and anti-Asian hate in general. Um, it's our elders we need to protect, but it's also our elders who we cannot we cannot communicate with. Uh, there's a silencing because we weren't we don't understand the history. Um, we have a different view of that history. We may or may not. But I'm wondering if we can bring the the two threads that we had discussed in, in segment one and segment two to bring to bear for segment three in terms of how do we understand our role as a community in the recent rise of, of anti of anti Asian hate. I think I'm supposed to start off here and, and let me just say that I think there are two vastly different kinds of responses to one's own personal tragedy, whether it's the tragedy of the war in Vietnam or whether it's the tragedy of anti Asian violence. One response is to say we're the victim again, we're the victims and to isolate our experience in that fashion. And unfortunately, I think that does characterize how a lot of people respond to tragedy. They focus on their own victimization. They don't see the connections to a systemic problem. The other response to anti-Asian violence is to say, yes, we are the victims of anti-Asian violence. And anti-Asian violence is not an accident in the country. It's systematic to the country. And it's systematic both in terms of how the United States has dealt with Asia and with Asian immigrants and Asian refugees and how the United States deals with Asian immigrants and refugees and Asian Americans in relation to other populations in this country. So from my perspective, you cannot talk about anti-Asian hate in this country without looking at the long history of anti-Asian violence domestically in this country and its connection to the histories of American wars in Asia 
which I think are acts of anti-Asian violence. When millions of Asians are dying because of American foreign policy decisions and because of the racist practices and attitudes of American policy planners, soldiers, and generals, and so on, that's anti-Asian hatred. And it brings, and it comes back to the United States and it circulates back out to how the United States conducts itself. Now, Vietnamese people in particular, they come to this country as refugees or as immigrants. And they discover that there are two ways, at least two ways to accelerate their process of Americanization. One way is to shut the door behind them. So this is how some Vietnamese refugees come here, are accepted, and then say, we are the good refugees. These new people, Muslims or brown people, are the bad refugees, don't let them in. That's a deeply problematic response, but it's not unique to Vietnamese people. Every immigrant and refugee group that comes to the United States some of them have done the exact same thing. Once they get here, they shut the door behind them. So the Vietnamese are simply co continuing in a very time-honored American tradition of shutting the door after they get in. The other response that Vietnamese, the other way that you can become Americanized very quickly is to participate in anti-Black racism. That anti-Black racism is fundamental to the United States and new immigrants who come here and discover that they are stigmatized for being the other can deflect some of that experience by participating in othering others, namely black people. But it's not just anti-black racism that's fundamental to this country. Of course, we have to talk about how this country has been built on genocide, slavery, colonization, and war. Every population of color in this country is subjected to its own particular form of racism and exploitation. And that's a part of how this country has been built on two things, both the, the wonderful idealism that Jilan talked about about democracy and its possibilities, and on the brutality of genocide, slavery, colonization, and war that are wrapped up with white supremacy. Now, you have to accept that argument. If you don't accept that argument, as I think a lot of Vietnamese refugees and immigrants would not accept that argument, then you don't see the systemic connections. If you do accept that argument, then you see the necessity to, loc to locate a response against anti-Asian violence in relationship to response to other forms of racist violence. That's why you can't separate anti-Black violence from anti-Asian violence, because basically we all take our turn. We all take our turn. Right now, it's the Asian turn. But it would be a mistake to think that somehow what's happening to us is separate from what's happening to Black people in this country. But if you don't accept the white supremacy argument, then you do, in fact, see these things as being completely separate. You don't see how it is that you as an Asian person or as a Vietnamese person being subjected to violence, that you share something in common with a black person. And instead, then we have the devolution into anti-black feeling and anti-black racism within Vietnamese and Asian American communities. I think Jelan is next. You know, I, um, I think that most refugees and especially Asian and maybe Vietnamese refugees and immigrants go, you know, return to the culture as a way, as a sanctuary to try to make it in America. So for example, the culture uh, in Confucianism has always respected education. And uh, there's a long history in um, Vietnamese history that says, you know, even if you're a poor, a boy from a very, very poor village in a hamlet somewhere in Vietnam, you can be part of the emperor's court if you pass this amazingly difficult test that will make you a Mandarin and a scholar. So there's this long history that if you follow, you know, like a certain recipe and it's the, the main ingredient in this recipe is education, you can make it. And so many of us, take the ingredient and that recipe and apply it to how are we going to make it in America? And education became a very, very important part. And I think it became shocking for many who take that route and take it with blinders, thinking that this is, this is my route and I'm not seeing the broad context uh, to, to, to suddenly be faced with like horrific, anti-Asian violence, not microaggression that maybe, you know, like, where are you from? And no, 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 where are you from? And, and you say New York and they're never happy with that, right? So those are the little things. But when you, when you see your elders suddenly, you know, now being attacked, it is a shock because it, it, it's, it's kind of like, well, we are the good refugees. We follow the rules. We play by the game. 
we're not threatening, and yet why are we being attacked, right? And I remember, uh, you know, I, I clerked uh, after law school for uh, Judge Constance Baker Motley, who is the first female African-American judge, federal judge appointed by President Johnson. And she was a lawyer for Martin Luther King, and she was she worked in tandem with Thurgood Marshall with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and argued against Jim Crow laws in the U.S., argued 10 cases before the U.S. Supreme Court and won nine. And my personal experience with her, she's, she's also an immigrant from Nevis, so we have that immigrant connection, was absolutely eye-opening to me in a way that no book about African-American history could ever open my eyes in the same way. And I think that Viet is very right that, you know, there's a sense that when we assimilate, we are going to assimilate into the most obvious mainstream standard there is using the recipe of education. And that means like we want to become as close to American whiteness as possible. And, what, and I'm not saying that people are doing this consciously. This could be a very unconscious process. And in so doing, you tend to detach yourself from the background history of that country that is not about whiteness. And that means that you don't really see your commonality with other ethnic minorities. And, and Viet said, well, you know, if, if you don't buy that argument, then you're not going to take the next step. Um, but I don't think you have to buy the argument. You can just say, hey, these are historical facts. What you, how you connect those historical facts together to come up with your theory, that's, you can have a different theory. But it is a historical fact <laughs> that there is slavery and there is you know, a lot of anti-Asian immigrant laws. So how are you gonna make, what, what do you say about those facts? You don't even have to say that they add up to a systematic and structural system of white supremacy if some people don't, go to, don't wanna go there. You don't need to. You just need to know that you can be very good and still suffer violence. So it is important in many ways that you know, those of us who have studied um, many layers of, Mer of American history and not just the shiny glittery part that we are drawn to. And I understand why we would want to be drawn to it. It's normal to be want to be drawn to it because it's the way that you feel like you can be accepted. Um, but if you dig deeper and you just see these facts, these are not hidden facts. I mean, we don't live in a communist system or an authoritarian system where there's only one version of history. Google it, it's all there and you will see, okay, these are the things that have happened. There are commonalities between you and African-Americans and more importantly to me, given our cultural background about debt, you know, all the Vietnamese is about debt. Like Dana, you know, uh, those are very, very strong, deeply seated Vietnamese attributes. All Vietnamese Americans and Asian Americans, when we enter this country in 75 and thereafter, owe a tremendous debt to the African-American civil rights movement. You would not be going to integrated schools, but for the amazing fortitude and strength of the African-American community. So pay your debt, okay? It's, it's, it's not a political statement. It's a historical fact. Use your culture that is about debt repayment and understand that there are other people in this country that have suffered tremendously and you have benefited from their struggles. And I think we need to take politics out of it. It is not, you know, Democrat, Republican, black, white, Asian. It's just what's right. And you will see that your suffering is very similar. It's a similar struggle for inclusion and for fairness. And if you see it that way, and you see that you have been the victim of discrimination and it's very painful, you do not want to replicate it. And I think that is very understandable to most of our elders who always teach us to pay debt, you know, make good karma. So I think the anti-Asian violence is very much tied 
to the sense that, you know, we're different, like, like, like being shocked by anti-Asian violence. We're different because we've played by the rule. We're not threatening. We're model. We're silent. We're passive. We integrate. It works up to a point, but at some point it's going to rupture. And I think the rupture can be shocking, but, you know, in moments of crisis, doors open. And I hope that both our elders and our younger generation can see how the door open for a very different kind of community that we can work with together and bridge the generational gap as well, relying on well-worn wisdom from our own elders about how to conduct ourselves as humans. Hoi. All right, well, uh, you. thank you, Jilang. I am mindful of the time. Um, so I'll just make two brief points before we open up the floor for questions and answers. Um, I, I agree with Jilang, uh, Jilang and then also uh, partly with Viet only, especially on, on the, the refugee um, issue and, and how, uh, you know, you, you think that the door, you, we would just shut the door once we in. I, I think that it is a bit more complicated than that. And, and number one, I'm speaking from the perspective of someone who didn't grow up in the US. And therefore I myself couldn't quite understand the, the strong sentiments attached to some of the issues in, you, in the US until recently, uh, you know, such as gun control, healthcare, abortion, and then race. I mean, I never quite understood why the issue of race is so, um, dominant here. And, and I only just found out later that it's not just because of the vast geopolitical differences between the 50 US states, uh, but it's also because everything is so big here and therefore it can be so easily amplified. I'm not saying that there's no uh, racism in Australia, right? But because the Aboriginal uh, people's population in Australia is so small compared to the African American community here. Therefore, their, their voice didn't really matter. So we didn't really have that much of a discussion regarding race in Australia as compared to in the US. So I think that it boils down to education as well. Because I think to a lot of Vietnamese Americans, they couldn't see the racism on the, on the surface, right? They just, they felt like, oh, they came here and they were given a fair go and then they benefited from that system. So why dismantle it? when we talk about racism these days, I think we talk about structural racism, about systematic racism, which then goes back to history, goes back to education. The more, I feel that the more educated we are, the, the, the more we learn about a country's history, say in the US, the more we will understand the underlying issues confronting the nation. Um, unfortunately, most Vietnamese Americans of the first generation don't necessarily have the same education level like us. And therefore they, they don't know much about slavery. They don't know much about how, you know, the African-American community were even denied uh, voting rights. Um, so I think that it's about education. So that's the first point I wanna make. The second point I wanna make is that for, for Vietnamese, uh, at least in my experience over the past three decades of advocating for for refugees uh, from Vietnam, the Vietnamese, the Vietnamese community has always been supportive of, of my work, um, starting in Hong Kong in the 90s to the Philippines uh, in the early 2000s, and then until the last chapter of the Vietnamese boat people that were closed only five years ago. I mean, many of them were stuck there for like, you know, nearly three decades. And it was the Vietnamese community that not only advocated for their resettlement, but also donated so much money. And I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of, of dollars being donate, donated to Voice to help with the resettlement process. So I don't think that the Vietnamese people as a people wanted to close the door, but here's the nuance. Many of them feel that they've been lining up, right? I mean, so many Vietnamese refugees, even in Thailand these days, we line up, we line up, to go to the State Department, to go to Congress and beg for their understanding and let us in, right? So we, we, we kind of like, we follow the system. For many, they don't understand why 
others can just come here and apply for refugee status, right? Uh, it is a right, it's a legal right for all asylum seekers to, to just go to the US and apply for asylum, right? It's a, it's a legal right, but not a lot of people know that. I mean, for many Vietnamese Americans, in fact, if not all Vietnamese Americans, they all went through the legal proper channel, which means, you know, they would flee Vietnam, they go to a camp and they will wait. They wait for a few months, for a few years, and then they wait for their turn. So they feel that it is a bit unfair in the sense that people can just come here and apply for asylum and then they get in. So I think that it is those nuances, those differences in their, their own refugee experience as compared to other refugee experiences. And, and, and that's why they feel that um, they're not as welcoming as we would like them to be. So um, on that note, I, I would like to, uh, you know, uh, give it back to either Professor Nguyen or, or Fan. Well, I think that point about education is important and the nuances that you're talking about. And, and obviously, if we're wanting to mount up a political campaign, we have to address people where they are and talk about the issues that you raised, Hoi. But I'll, I'll de depart a little bit by saying that, of course, the Vietnamese people gave money to helping Vietnamese refugees get in. So when we say when I say shut the door, I mean, we, we don't want to shut the door on other Vietnamese people because we understand where they're coming from. What we see there is an expression of empathy. We're Vietnamese, they're Vietnamese, we've got to help them out. And I don't think, as important as education is, I would say that, uh, there, the, and, and that might help empathy, there is a particular issue here around our capacity for empathy. Just because we're ignorant about someone's situation or someone's history doesn't mean we shouldn't be empathetic about where they're coming from and what, and what they need, right? So that, that would be one, where, one, one place where I would depart. Another issue is, in fact, there was an exception made for Southeast Asians in 1975 and, and, and afterwards in the, for the so-called boat people generation and uh, refugees from Laos and Cambodia, they were let in without having to wait, at least in those early years. So you're talking about a slightly different situation where people did in fact have to wait for decades and so on. So I think that for many uh, Vietnamese people, perhaps they, they, like a lot of other Americans, don't see that refugees, people who are coming to the south of the border, for example, and being characterized as illegal aliens or undocumented migrants could also be seen as refugees fleeing from circumstances that the United States has had a direct impact on. And so there, there's, there's, there's a variety of different kinds of, of issues that, that are happening here. Yep. All right, well, we have an enormous set of questions in the Q&A chat box. And I think there's also, we have a, a kind of stunning array of topics that have come up over the course of the past 60 minutes or so. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pose a question that congeals a couple of the themes that we've seen in the chat box, first of all. Um, so there, there's been, uh, for the most part, I'm going to um, uh, reformulate a question from a student named um, Lexis. Uh, she's one of my students. Uh, they're one of my students, and, and I'm going to privilege their question because it's pretty excellent. Um, so what they ask is, they in response to some of Lan's points uh, on, in this last segment about, or actually from the previous segment about constitutionality and the ideal of democracy, I think this is, intersects with the conversation that we just had. Um, Lexis raises the issue of, you know, uh, what happens when uh, refugees of any stripes, but particularly Vietnamese Americans, come to Vietnam, America and start to recognize that the practice, the praxis of democracy in America particularly because of systemic racism, is there's a, there's a disjunction. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. There are minorities that in fact are systemically, um, you know, um, oppressed. And so there is a kind of, there's a distance between even if, if we are able to educate on the ideal of how US style democracy is meant to work, uh, there's a distance between that and the way it is experienced, particularly by marginalized people in the US. So I guess what I'd like to ask you, it reminds me of Lan Gao's statements because many in the audience reacted to Lan Gao's concept of, you know, cha no, lam ơn, but you have to biết ơn before you can cha, you know. No? So in some ways, I think Lan, you started to speak a little bit about a way to have a dialogue about how to speak across the generational experience. But one of the things that really divides that generational experience is the reaction to a perception of how democracy is actually practiced, you know, and to, to give you the, you know, Viet mentioned many of the hot button issues that are in fact the divisive ones, such as Black Lives Matter, 
such as the concept of law and order, such as, as we talked about earlier, the response to um, uh, former President Trump's challenging of the election. So this is becoming long-winded. I'm gonna cut myself short, but just to clarify, you know, can, can all of you think a little bit about or comment a bit about beyond educating the ideal, you know, how, does, how does the diverse Vietnamese community respond to the reality of marginalized experiences in the US? You know, um, because the difference in that response seems to be part of the divisiveness. We don't have an order first, but maybe I can invite Lan Cao, I don't know if she's frozen or not, to begin the discussion because uh, in many ways uh, it was her comments that raised it. Ti Lan, I'm not sure if you're frozen or not. You look a little frozen. <laughs> you know, you, John, oh, we're going in and out, so I, I only got some snippets. Um, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. I'm not sure if, I'm, if anybody can hear me. Okay. Well, I think the, the point that there is a discrepancy between the ideals and the reality, I mean, that's, I think that's just a state of life in, in any country and even in a person, right? I mean, if you look at your own life, you may have a certain set of aspiration for your own conduct. And sometimes you don't yourself uh, live up to your own uh, moral compass for yourself. So I think that's just an issue of um, failure of a country and of human beings. And since countries are made up of human beings, no matter how great the laws are, um, there's going to be that disconnect between the reality of how things really are on the ground and the aspirations. But at least in this country, I mean, I guess it's because I'm a lawyer and um, I have a lot of faith in you know, participating within the legal system. Maybe it's incremental, uh, in incremental improvement, but you know, that I, I, I think that progressively we do get to the place that we uh, want to be um, with respect to, I, I think you also asked something about the January 6th event again, right, John? I'm not sure. That's right. And let me also add part of uh, Alexis's question is, is pointing to the idea that that mismatch that you've just described, that is maybe part of what drives many different types of people to embrace things like outsider, you know, figures, because there is a kind of uh, uh, there's a loss of hope in the system in some senses. So I wonder if you can speak a bit about maybe that loss of faith in the system as a part of the experience of a mar being marginalized in the US. Is that an ingredient in, um, in what's happening in the Vietnamese American community? Yeah. Or anyone. Um. And if, if there's a need to- I mean, I think that, that, that's, a, a, that's a root. Oh. Maybe I can jump in while, while you know, in this little pause yeah. here. Um, and if I understand the question correctly, I'll answer it in my own way, which is, you know, I've, I've always felt a little bit out of place in the Vietnamese American community. And so the fact that we're witnessing dissension and disagreement within the Vietnamese American community uh, doesn't bother me so much. And then this idea that some people have that, how do we bring the Vietnamese American community together? Maybe we can't. Maybe the only thing that unifies us is pho. And even then we like, oh, Northern pho, Southern pho, then we have another civil war over that issue. So there are some things that unify us and they're important, but I don't know if we should be looking for political unity. The Vietnamese people in Vietnam certainly didn't, didn't agree with each other. And so for me, the, the, one of the things about being Vietnamese that's obviously very important to, to a lot of us is this idea of familiarity, uh, piety, debt, and so on, kinship, all really important. And we feel bound and close to each other by the cultural and personal emotional heritages, heritages that we have. But I think that when it comes to politics, maybe we should leave some of that behind. There are reasons to organize as Vietnamese Americans, but then there are reasons to oppose other Vietnamese Americans we disagree with. And on some very fundamental political issues around some of the things we've talked about today, I would rather 
choose my kinship. I would rather choose an affiliation with people who I agree with, but who don't look like me versus trying to agree with people who look like me, but who you know, are, we're never going to agree on certain kinds of issues. And I think it's perfectly fine to do that. And that's part of the political maturation process to feel that we don't have to be together simply because we're Vietnamese. Can, uh, can I jump in right now? Please. All right, uh, that, that's a good point to make, Viet, and, and, and it's true. I mean, like, what, sometimes I do struggle and, and, and ask myself, like, why do we have to unite the community? But to many um, elders out there, uh, they feel that we should because the fight for them is still somehow to bring democracy to Vietnam. I think that if we talk about democracy, and about the Vietnamese American community, I think there are three things that, that we should bear in mind. Uh, number one, um, you know, through my, my work uh, as both a, a TV host and, and as a, um, a human rights activist, everywhere I, I go, whether in Australia, Europe, I hear the elders blaming democracy for the loss of South Vietnam. You know, like they would say like, because we tried to, uh, you know, install democracy while we have a war, that's why we lost because, you know, uh, things were just going, uh, were just out of hand. So, so many in our community uh, don't necessarily share the same democratic ideals as us uh, because they, they, they blame it for it. Number two, I think that even democracy for, for someone like me, I, I, I don't necessarily think that democracy in the US and the political system in the US is the best system for democracy. I mean, coming from Australia where the Westminster system for me ensures better democratic ideals to be practiced. Uh, I mean, I would even dare to say that you, you it wouldn't be possible to have Trumpism in Australia. It just, it's just a bit impossible to, for, for such a leader to be elected in, in Australia through the Westminster a political system. So that's the second thing I want to talk about is like democracy uh, as a principle um, may, may, may seem not so great um, to quite a few people outside of the US, given what happened in the US. And the third thing is for many Vietnamese Americans, when they talk about democracy, it's not democracy in the US, it's democracy in Vietnam. And so what they would say is like, why do we have all these um, differences, why can't we have one voice, speak with one voice so that the US can somehow help Vietnam become a democracy, you know? Um, so, so those are the three points I wanted to, to mention. Uh, over to you, Ji Lai. Actually, if, if I can jump in here, just oh. to add on to that, that question yeah. and then give it over to, to Ji Lang. Um, uh, when I ask it, there's a question uh, in the chat um, you know, this is leaving aside Viet's point about should we even come together? Maybe it's, it's good to, to, to disagree and to let many different opinions and perspectives flourish. Uh, one comment or one response could be that, you know, as, as mainstream Americans, non-Asian uh, Americans and non-Vietnamese Americans put us together, uh, you know, one of the things that I really resisted uh, in the run up to the election was to speak for this homogenous monolithic Vietnamese American community and how we vote. Um, so, so that's, you know, in a sense that, that people are going to make some of us spokespeople for it. You are a very good example of it. You've had to do that. Um, but the question that, that a lot of the uh, audience has asked is about fake news. So this seems to be a major obstacle for us to reach uh, the various generations uh, in our community. Uh, what, is, uh, what is your response to, to battling uh, this, this phenomenon that I think, you know, while it is not unique to the Vietnamese American community, uh, given the, the unique role that Vietnam plays in the generation of fake news, uh, its impact in terms of, uh, you know, in the Vietnamese American audience, and our inability to form bridges and connections and networks outside of our community uh, is, is, I think, something that is actually unique to, to Vietnamese Americans. So if I could turn it over to Di Lang first, to Lang first to talk about, about the impact of, of fake news. Well, you know, when we're, it's inevitable that news, just like any other entity 
is going to have a certain bias, whether it be subconscious or not. But that is very different from fake news. Okay, And I think that the, the term fake news may have some emotional resonance to some elders in the Vietnamese American community because, um, y- y- and, 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 and let, let me backtrack a little bit before I, before I follow through that, with that uh, thread. There's a, there's a lot of problems with news that is indeed fake, that is propagated as part of a propaganda that is being used by subgroups in the US and by foreign groups outside of the US to influence what's happening. I think that's been pretty much established. So, that, so I wanna say that, there, that I'm not talking about that kind of fake news, right? So if you encounter that on, on your Facebook or on the internet when you're just Googling, uh, and if you check and see that it's not picked up by any other legitimate sort of mainstream channel, um, and there's a diverse group of them, the Economist, Time, Newsweek, even all the mainstream one, then you could look at that and say, I need some backup before I just go around and uh, repost that. But setting that type of fake news aside where somebody, some you know, person just in the shadow uh, of some corner is just posting something on social media, uh, the press may be biased just like anybody else is biased, but that's not the same as fake news. And as I mentioned, when I spoke uh, about rule of law and democracy, um, democracy is liberal democracy. And when I say liberal democracy, I'm not talking about liberal Democrat or Republican, but I'm talking about a kind of John Stuart Mill's kind of liberal democracy. Um, It is not about monolithic voice. So you need a press and it is the first amendment in the US. And the, the thing, so, the, the reason why the fake news may have resonance to the elders in the Vietnamese community is that there's a sense, right, that the, the American press was against South Vietnam or was, was being used by um, the communist side and was being leveraged and manipulated. And I, I think that is very much something that can be legitimately discussed, right? So for example, how the Tet Offensive was presented uh, by the American press to the American public, we can debate that, but that's not the same as fake news. Um, So with respect to the sense that, you know, uh, CNN is fake news, the New York Times is fake news, everybody is fake news except the the people that you agree with. I think think that is a very big disservice to liberal democracy system of the US is designed to take into account to take that into account because the First Amendment uh, does not allow the government to abridge any uh, news or any information that it doesn't approve of. And in fact, you know, whether you agree with this or not, uh, the, the First Amendment of the US as in the Supreme Court uh, does not consider that there is many Western European countries uh, categorize hate speech like Germany and does not allow it, especially if it relates to the Holocaust. But that's not the point, uh, that's not the position taken in the US. So there is a great reverence in the US to, um, again, you know, this is aspirational uh, and I am mindful of John student who talked about the discrepancy between how things are supposed to function versus how it is in reality. But In the US, there is free speech, free press, and there's a belief in marketplace of ideas so that even odious ideas can be put there on the table, not uh, suppressed, even hateful speech, even hate speech, and that there will be a marketplace of competition of ideas. Um, And then of course, you can talk about whether or not the powerful has, has, has greater voice, but that's a different issue. So I am very much against the notion that the, you know, everything you disagree with is fake news, because if you are interested in uh, a liberal democracy, you, you, you can't um, sweep everything uh, away as fake news. And I think it's, it's a very catchy term, unfortunately.
I'll, I'll just jump in here then. I'll, I'll just add one more thing, which is I think that you know, to generalize again, you know, there is a linguistic difference along with a generational difference. So that older Vietnamese people tend to speak Vietnamese and younger Vietnamese Americans tend to speak English. And obviously there are younger Vietnamese Americans who speak Vietnamese and older Vietnamese who speak English, but generally, right, that's what's happened. And you know, what's happened over the last 40 years or so is that we've developed two different kinds of media worlds in the Vietnamese American community, one based in Vietnamese and one based in English. And I've chosen the English route for better and for worse. And you know, what that means is that even when, when we talk about literature and the importance of Vietnamese American literature to telling our stories and all of that, there's a big difference between the kinds of stories that Vietnamese American writers tell in English and what they tell in Vietnamese, that there's a whole separate world of Vietnamese literary publishing and news and all of that going on. And it's a really regrettable divide in the community. And the creation of a Vietnamese language media has been absolutely important to the development of a Vietnamese American community here because it's allowed Vietnamese Americans who speak Vietnamese only to obviously tell their own stories, report their own news because they're neglected by English language media. The new challenge for us now, I think, is obviously the development of a bilingual, you know, Vietnamese American culture. And it's kind of hard to do because I look at people like, you know, Lian Hang and, and John, you guys are totally fluent in Vietnamese, you're bilingual, and but your work is oriented towards so far towards Vietnam. And that that also reflects these divisions as well within scholarship. You know, some Vietnamese Americans have done English language work based on the United States, and some have done Vietnamese language work, but it's usually about Vietnam. So I think our challenge, one of the ways by which we fight against fake news is to develop bilingual methods of speaking to each other. And some of that work has already taken place with the with Pivot, the Progressive Vietnamese Network, and with their organization, Viet Fact Check, and The Interpreter. There's, there are younger Vietnamese Americans out there who are bilingual who are trying to do this. But what I would say is that it's, it's beholden on all of us, you know, to, to, to give money, to support these organizations, to start these kinds of institutions that can actually lead to a bilingual Vietnamese American uh, media and community. Um, thank you, Viet. I just wanna add uh, to what Viet just said, uh, and that's what each of us is doing right now. I mean, I know that um, John and Hang um, are helping us by having this uh, talk uh, being translated into Vietnamese uh, with, with Vietnamese subtitle. I myself am hoping to do like a an hour long uh, special report on this talk for the the for Viet Face TV where I'm working at at the moment, and that is each of us. Uh, it's our own attempt to bring this dialogue uh, to to the community. Um, but in respect of fake news, I think that apart from the language barrier, um, what we should also notice is that even with Twitter and other social media um, platforms. I mean, it took them quite a while to then tag uh, whether the, you know, a particular website is, is media, uh, is government being media or inde independent media. That, that's only a recent um, phenomena. With, for Vietnamese, it, it doesn't even exist, you know, um, because many Vietnamese Americans don't speak English they have to rely on Vietnamese speaking hosts, right? And the Vietnamese speaking hosts, knowing the sentiments of their audience, usually will say things that will jive with their, their audience. That's number one. Number two, the, I mean, numerous studies have shown that the more controversial your comments are, or the more controversial the, the issue becomes, the better the viewship, right? And for all these YouTubers or Vietnamese uh, hosts want to be, they want to earn as much money as possible on YouTube, right? They want to have as many clicks as possible. So it is in their interest to talk about fake news and, and to really make the issue sound so ridiculous. But it's not because they really care about the issues. It's just because they want to make more money. So I think that if we bear that in mind and, and with each of us attempt to correct that path, I, I think there is hope for, for uh, in the future. Yep. All right, we are already past the end of the, the official end of the event. I just wanted to acknowledge that there are an enormous number of really interesting questions and topics that we did not get to. Uh, questions such as, you know, um, a couple uh, audience members, including uh, a couple audience members, raised the issue of the dynamic relationship with Vietnam, for example. Uh, 
Uh, I think um, Hoi and Viet uh, both talked to the diversity of the Vietnamese American community, but the question was, how does that diversity interact with a changing Vietnam, particularly after Doi Mui, something we didn't quite get to. And we had several second generation and third generation um, students also pose the question of, the direct question, quite movingly, of how specifically to, to speak to the older generation um, along the lines of, of, of the last topic we just mentioned. So I just wanted to say, first of all, that I think particularly um, Viet's description of the diversity of the Vietnamese community, I'm sorry, Ahoy's description of that, and then Viet's point that, you know, we need not necessarily all be homogenous. In fact, one of the major, I think, outcomes of this meeting has been to state the diversity of the Vietnamese American community to great effect. I think that's great. But I, I just wanted to say that in some senses, being a member of a community is a kind of excuse to exercise and cultivate the empathy that we had also mentioned. I think Lang Kao's comments about debt and about finding a language, a cultural language to expand and to engage in dialogue is another great sort of outcome of this conversation uh, over the past hour or so. So um, I apologize, we apologize to all of the attendees for not lodging all of your questions, um, but I'm gonna turn it now over to Hank to end our event. And I'm just gonna end it by saying thank you. And I think I saw somewhere in the chat about 30 minutes ago that, that I think um, we can declare April 30th, uh, 2021 as a victory for, here from Colombia because we have shown the full diversity and strength of the Vietnamese American community. Uh, and the second thing is I think we started a conversation. This has to be the start and we will address uh, these questions that you have um, possibly, you know, after the pandemic, we can bring Hoi, Lang, and Viet to New York City um, and have a Zoom element, but have them here in person, and we'll continue uh, continue this conversation. In response to those of you who've asked if we've re recorded this, this is a recording, uh, and as we stated at the um, at the start, that uh, Vin will uh, do uh, Vietnamese subtitles for those of you uh, who would prefer to read um, what we have what we've said uh, in Vietnamese. So, with that, thank you so much for everyone uh, who's tuned in today and um that's it thank you so much i want to say thank, thank you. you again to lian hang and, and john uh for for organizing this and weatherhead east asian institute for hosting us and also to hoi and i just really love this conversation uh we're all in southern california so you can also do it here at usc not yeah. just columbia as well when, when <laughs> is over. yeah I, li I like that suggestion a bit i also want to say thank hey, you new yorkers <laughs> you can come here I also want to say thank the, you so much. Mohammed can come to the mountain. Yeah, thank you so much for attending this event. Uh, the, the audience out there, I couldn't quite see you guys. But, um, and, and thank you to the organizers. Finally, one bucket uh, list of mine is crossed. And I'm so happy because I'm sure my dad and mom will be so proud. I've been surrounded by four professors, you know, like they would never dream that I would be able to do that. But I've done it. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're coming to California, so get ready. Yay! <laughs> Bye. Bye. Take care, everybody. Bye.